guess we're we're like busy checking in or i mean very informally cool jay where have you guys escaped to uh yeah in-laws we kind of made an excuse to go see the in-laws Ari's parents in uh in chicago which was a very intense uh four-day journey uh and kind of putting you know putting all of the grief and questioning of what does it mean to have half to lose half of your valley basically um kind of to the side and now it's it's catching up with me again oh man So there's, there's some very big questions about, I was just taking this moment, there's some very big questions about what are the implications if you, you know, the town next to you burns and yours doesn't. So I live in Ashland, um, the two towns next to you. Uh, and what, what does support look like? And of course, there's the immediate support, but then there's the long term support. And so there's a lot of you know, food drives, clothing drives, things like that for the immediate and a lot of attention that's going there, thankfully. But, but, you know, some of my questions are, what does this mean in the, in the bigger picture? And do we just rebuild exactly as it was and what happens to the people that don't, can't actually move back there? So some really big questions that I think are appropriate to bring to the group. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And Pete posted a really interesting thread about um, fuels and, climate change and all that and fires. Did you see that one? Uh, I literally landed uh, after 2000 mile drive this week already, 2200 miles uh, last night. Um, but wow. I did get a chance to see the, um, the group on uh, the, the conversation on new beginnings and new endings, which I'm very intrigued by. So that's about as far as I've gotten. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you guys are okay and t totally get the weight of the, uh, of the issues you're talking about. It's crazy. Um, as check-ins go, how about uh, Judy, Charles, Doug? Judy, since you have your mic open. Um, I don't have a lot to add this week. I'm just continuing to work on how we interface with public schools in terms of delivery of art curricula. Thank you. Um, Charles, you just muted, which means you might have walked away. There we go. I'm here. Um... Yeah, I was going to organize more or better, but um, yeah, of all the things I think that, that's most um, present and alive with Kiko Lab in particular is business modeling, is kind of heavy lifting of um, figuring out um, fields and canvases and also kind of being being or getting ready for funding of different kinds, such as uh, grants and um, support through nonprofit um, type channels. So between between those things and trying to find um, a bridge between those approaches and, and how we can streamline our efforts, but also just kind of um, articulate more what are our goals and, and uh, how we're going to go about that. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. Does that also include like um, whether or not to incorporate or become some kind of an entity? Well, we are, or I have a nonprofit entity, a 501c3 that um, is available for uh, however and whatever um, we want and need. So that's there in the mix. And tonight cool. we're meeting with a friend of mine who's a quite a successful fundraiser, uh, nonprofit consultant. Um, but we also spoke at length with Pete here and um, Max Harper and a, a few other other friends of ours in the, in the circles um, who are giving us some wonderful inputs and tough love <laughs> as to um, homework that we have and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren is clapping. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. It's, it's uh, sort of end of uh, summer weather. I've been enjoying some Meet, meetings uh, but out by the lake and kind of combining things getting a bit more social but tentatively um yeah check cool thank you uh doug hank mark okay other than dealing with the aftermath of the fires which means uh residual smoke and mostly coping with people who are saying they're now going to leave california trying to figure out the implications of that because some of them have pretty interesting positions in hierarchies here. 
which leads to what the, the big thing for the week has been trying to start conversations in a fairly stable organization, which means an organization that has top-down uh, commands and sideways cooperation, but no conversation about what the organization is about. So how do you get a conversation going in such a place? We have broken out a core group that's committed to doing conversations, but the reach out to people who say, oh, I'm just too busy. Uh, it's really important what you're doing, but I can't do it now. Uh, so I'm struggling with that. It's, it's actually kind of fun, but it's also uh, dealing with the nature of hierarchies. Yeah, it feels to me like if you say something controversial enough or important enough in your subgroup, they'll show up meaning like imagine the building is has been torn down and restart redesigning it or some, something where they realize they must be involved as opposed to hey we're about to have a conversation about the future but not and i don't know where you were on it but but i think that a small group that actually is lights a lights a big fire will will attract attention somehow will it not well in this case we've actually done pretty big questions like that yeah. And people still, they're afraid to bite into those questions because it means they're going to have to do something different. Yeah. And who wants to do that except people like us? Right. Well, you seem to have a small crew, a small band of, of merry uh, revolutionaries going. So, yeah. Well, anybody else with uh, good ideas, we can chime in at the end of the, of the check-in. Uh, Hank, Mark, Scott. Yeah, so um, I mean, as far as check-ins go, I, I think I got a couple things. I finally <clears throat> feel like I'm kind of um, settled in the or moved in, but not completely settled into this new spot in Boston and, in week three, um, which is which is great. It's um, kind of nice to be in a more vibrant city, um, though I did love Providence a lot. Um, I think last week. Maybe I made a comment that, you know, I kind of realized that I was like mentally kicking a lot of things down the road during my move. Um, and it's been kind of funny, like I've been journaling again and just a, a couple, I've been thinking about, I think a lot more things that that feel a little like more OGME. I think that's the, and I'll dip into them for a minute. I think, you know, the first thing is I've been really thinking a lot about just the concept of incentives, um, specifically as they relate to organizations and just our lives and how our general society is constructed. Um, obviously, that's a super broad statement. Um, I've been thinking a lot more specifically than that. But um, just in interest of keeping this check in short, I'll just say that's kind of what I've been thinking of. And, you know, um, it just a, it, it gives I think it opens up a lot of lenses to think through the general statements that I think people make. It's like, what are you really asking yourself and others to do? Um, and have you really thought about it that way, right? Um, not that it changes any of the rhetoric, but sometimes it can just add a little bit more seasoning to it, perhaps. Um, I think also just kind of given the backdrop of, you know, the election coming up and everything going on on the West Coast, um, I've, re I've been trying to take more think time to think about, um, you know, just the the general conversation going around um and, and why people are scared specifically you know people on the the right um uh, side of things i obviously don't mean right isn't correct i just mean right as in mm -hmm. um, you know more more right leaning um and it's really something i think just given my background just being from you know, the, the, the Bible Belt region of the country uh, I, that I've really tried to kind of dig into um, and it from more of a place of understanding. Um, I, and as far as the, you know, the fires and things, I just, I, I listened to an interesting talk recently that I'm still working to pull apart. Um, and the, but the overall message was basically just like, you know, climate change is real, climate change is man-made, but we have time to fix it. Um, and I think that like that message against the backdrop of like record breaking fires is, it's kind of hard to, hard to sit side by side and like, and rectify. Right. And so I'm just trying to kind of put some mental calories against that. So, um, that's my check-in. I pass the torch. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And that, that's a, oh, sorry, bad pun. That, uh, that's a hot topic. Um, <laughs> 
and and in, in particular trump was in california was addressed directly as we need to stop ignoring the stuff and dismiss it immediately so that's like right yeah. front top dead center it's right, right crazy times um thanks hank we'll come back to that uh scott mark lauren hey everyone um things are good up here we're in michigan and we're starting to see the smoke which is stunning that we are that far away and um, in just the tiniest bit being uh, affected by it and, and, and with you in this. Um, two thoughts for this morning. Um, the first is I've mentioned before that my interest is in taking some of these ideas and distilling them for, ch for children to help create the next generation of thinkers. I kind of evolved that a little bit and I, I realized during the week that if we're spending all our time trying to solve the problems and we end up being, you know, unsuccessful in that, now we have spent that time and not also develop the next generation who's going to pick up the torch. Um, and also, you know, the reality is that problems have no end state that we have the problem and then we have the next one and the next one. And so I think that there's a parallel path there and that we try to solve problems, but we also develop the people who will solve the next problems. Um, so that's a, that's a thought. And the second thing is I also was looking at some, shall we say presidential speeches this week and an essay came up in my history. Uh, it's called On Bullshit. And it's actually a wonderful little treatise on the fact that, that BS is intended to persuade without regard for the truth. And the liar cares about the truth and attempts to hide it. The bullshitter oh. doesn't care about the truth, whether it's true or false. They just care whether the listener is persuaded. So say, say something false and, and it's, false and, and they just move on. If it doesn't have any effect, they, they move on to the next thing until eventually the persuasion happens. So I'll include a link in the chat about, oh, we already have it, <laughs> of that, that essay. So I think it's, you might disregard it because based on the title, but actually when you read this short piece, it's just, it's, it's wonderfully insightful. So good morning, everyone. That all seems like a magnet to me. <laughs> um, Thanks, Scott. Good morning. Uh, Mark, uh, which way are we going? Um, um, let's go Mark, Lauren, Julian. Good morning. Um, a, a quick follow up on something Hank said, because I think it, it's sort of apropos the larger conversation. The, um, you know, the climate messaging that, that Hank referred to there's a there's an enormous literature out there. There's all sorts of all sorts of insight into how to communicate climate change, um, and the necessity of of different audiences and speaking to specific audiences and using the right messenger. You know, we generally do none of any of that. So mm -hmm. all we really do is come out with a message that is sort of tries to appeal to everyone. And so it's always we're all going to die unless we very easily fix it tomorrow, and. And it, it's just, it just doesn't work as a message. Uh, and, but, but that's sort of where most of our climate communications are because we think we have to sound the alarm and we have to be helpful. And yet we know from a communication science perspective, that's not the right way to do it. Um, but on, on, on a larger scale, being here in Portland, stuck in the house now again, um, the, you know, I'm thinking about tipping points because we've been talking for years about when might we see a tipping point in, for example, coastal real estate values. And, you know, I think, I, I mean, there are already people investing money in the collapse of real estate markets on the coast of Florida uh, because they think that time is coming very soon. And with five Atlantic storms, that time might be here. Uh, the, the, the implications for Oregon, California, and other states, just from a fire insurance perspective, uh, in terms of the aftermath of these fires, are going to be mind-boggling. You know, with so much of the building that's happened in the urban wildland interface, 
so much of that is going to become either uninsurable or with insurance rates that the people owning those homes are not going to be able to afford. And what does that do for the whole dynamic of how Oregon and California have been developing? Um, this week had the unfortunate effect of having many conversations turned to sort of post doom scenarios. <clears throat> and I think some people in the room were, were in some of those conversations and uh, it's uh, sobering, clarifying, uh, in a weird way, bittersweetly positive because you start thinking, oh, okay, let, let's assume that, that the brakes are off, that we can't, oops, sorry, uh, Kevin, I meant to leave your hand up. Um, you know, how, how does this play out? Um, so let's actually uh, go with the, the check-ins for a second and do uh, Julian, then Kevin. So on a, a different topic, having been un unable to leave the house for the last week, I'm focused on this computer graphics data uh, knowledge base I've described before. This is one about the past and future history of computer graphics. Uh, it's being done in, in, with the ACM. Uh, for the last week, I've been focusing on the ingest problem, which is not just a matter of transferring data from one database to another, but also looking at what does it mean? What, does it, what do you mean when you say information in 10 years from now, because technology such as virtual reality change what it is that you're doing in order to create knowledge. And whenever you create knowledge, it needs to be integrated in, into the knowledge base. So I've been focusing on how do we capture uh, data that's outside the realm of what IT can handle. And not only that, make the system extensible enough so that data we don't know that's going to exist in 10 years can likewise be in collected and integrated. Along the way, I'm starting to look at the difference between property graphs and RDF graphs, because this will be an essential technology decision. Um, so, uh, and uh, let's see, in the interest of being practical this weekend, I'm going to try sucking data from the art history database into the trial database, uh, and just to see what happens. So I'm trying to keep a very practical bent on the things I'm doing. And uh, when the air clears up, then get to go and do it on the patio instead of here in the living room. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Um, cool. And now I'm, I'm forgetting my order. So uh, Kevin, Rob, Max. Okay. Really quickly. <clears throat> Mark's um, remark about shorting the coast reminded me of, a, <clears throat> I was talking to a big hedge fund manager about five years ago and he was at something like his mother's 95th birthday. And it was a big, you know, intergenerational family thing. And he was watching his eight-year-old daughter dive in the pool while he was uh, telling me that he was going to short the long bond, <clears throat> which meant he was going to make a big bet that the U.S. was less valuable in 20 years. And I said, well, that's undercutting the future of your eight-year-old that you, that you love and are diving into the pool. He says, yeah, but I can't not make this trade. And, and he, was, he was stuck in his own world. And so anyway, the other thing is I've, I've formed this cohort of people doing what I'm doing, kind of these democratized local financial instruments and, and things. And uh, I've got about five people that I, some I've known for a decade. And, and the other one, I just put a link to one group that reached out in, in uh, near Chicago. And I think it's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, there are a bunch of things that can definancialize the economy that are starting to work. That we're trying to network each other. So Anyway, that's it. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm looking forward to that, those things actually working. Um, Rob, Max, Lauren. Yeah. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I joined in a little bit late, have uh, juggling many things today. I, I brought my daughter to her orthodontist appointment and uh, it just, it was a contrast of like a very normal daily thing that goes on versus just the craziness going on in the world. Um, so I was feeling some gratitude that I have the opportunity to bring my daughter to the orthodontist, um, but uh, also just trying to, I guess for, for me this week, I've been trying to get more in touch with my core thoughts of what I think is true and trying to slow down the barrage of information that, that just keeps coming at us. Um, so I guess a little more personal reflection about some of these, uh, you know, the social uh, unrest in the country, the election, the 
our place in the world, our place as world citizens, um, just trying to spend more time on what do I make of all of that versus looking outside for, for, for you know, readings or, or input on that. So um, it's, it's been good. And uh, um, I've been using uh, Obsidian to kind of organize a lot of thoughts that I've had and that's been, been working well um, uh, to just kind of give a little structure to my, to my writing. So all good. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Uh, Max Lauren Klaus. Hey, I'm gonna need to um, skip my verbal update. My wife is leading a conference call. Um, so you, 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 could do it, you could do it in interpretive dance or something. Um, Works perfectly. Uh, thanks, Max. Uh, feel free to put something in the chat as well if you want to just uh, let us know what you're up to. Um, Lauren, Klaus, Pete. Oh, hey, everyone. I've just been thinking about several things that are kind of swirling around. First of all, uh, Matt's idea of kind of getting together and um, talking about uh, business plans and stuff like that and how he's uh, been kind of, uh, you know, forming together some pitches and stuff and how I think that we could really, it might be nice to all get together and do some kind of uh, strategy for a soft pitch, including uh, maybe some influential people that we have connections to. Uh, for example, um, like, I don't, like a New York Times op-ed writer that we can Say, for example, there's something like Jerry had this post about um, Trump and his strategy, his kind of like projection strategy, but there's no word for that. Like, could we think up a word for that and get together and kind of use these sessions? We have all these groups going on and meeting at different times to kind of link them together, tie them together and actually like come up with a concept and then get it to a point where it becomes a thing that's written about and it'd be like, can we birth a concept that actually is in the news and, you know, gathers steam. I think that could be super easy and would be great at that and wouldn't even have to do anything or put money in or we can just kind of do that at the regular times that we meet. I think it'd be super simple. Then we can do kind of like a little documentary on how we achieved that super simple and um, that way we can feel like we're kind of making an impact and show how we do that, what kind of process we use. So it's just an idea. I think it might be fun, relevant, impactful, and get us to do something. Um, just a tiny thought along those lines. I, I borrow the hand signs from Occupy, which borrows them from sign language and from the Puerta del Sol protests in Spain, they, they have some history. But my hope, my hack is, because I do these all the time everywhere, my hope is that sometime in a presidential press conference we'll see people doing this, which means that, <clears throat> that the thing <clears throat> propagated enough to show up in a, in a place where it mattered <clears throat> and where it might really cascade out and do things. So, uh, so I think maybe hacking memes or whatever to do that with important messages uh, could really work. But, but I, th I think I would include uh, gesture, you know, like free hugs is this really interesting meme that just propagates. People can walk out and say, hey, free hugs. Um, so, uh, or tunes or other kinds of things, right? So how, how might that work? So I think it's a, it's a great goal. <clears throat> Did you want to add something, Lauren? You're muted. I just think that it would be nice to have some kind of a strategy group to kick that off to see what connections we might have and how we could use those and kind of like uh, set the strategic direction of the hive. And Jerry, I think you'd actually be really good uh, at that being a dot connector and um, really well connected as well. Thank you, thank you. All right, so let's, um, let's focus that one. Um, Klaus, Pete, Math, and me. Yeah. <clears throat> Talking about uh, uh, climate change messaging, we, we had a team meeting yesterday um, with business climate leaders, uh, which is an initiative by Citizen Climate Lobby, and they are organized by sectors. So I'm sector leader agriculture, 
but they have a sector leader, food and beverage and electrical systems and healthcare and education and so on. And we, we talked about how do you convey, for example, to farmers, which are our primary target group now, uh, a conversation about climate change, which they are like radically opposed to, to talking about. I mean, they're, they're completely rejecting a conversation because to the farmer, a conversation about climate change is government interference into their business. You know, they're expecting regulations and so on. And they, they just categorically reject that. Um, and so the, 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 the core learning of our group over, and I've been with them now for several years, is that you, you have to bring the topic into their particular environment. So for a farmer, for example, the loss of topsoil, uh, the fires burning right now in California, um, the, the flooding that they are experiencing on soil that is depleted and washes out. I mean, those are all very practical topics. So we're in the process of starting a national campaign, which in fact I'm, I'm working on right now to, uh, to bring these conversations segment specific to the food and agriculture industry. So, so you're talking to an organic farmer with a different message than you would talk to a commodity farmer, for example. Um, you would talk to uh, the supply chain differently, uh, depending on, on what they're specialized in. So the, the, the point is that the message has to be differentiated um, and, and, and brought into the life experience of your audience. So interestingly, the Sierra Club is starting what they call the Thrive Act, which is now winding its way through Congress and already have over 100 uh, members of Congress who signed on to it. A recognition that we are, we are moving into a really bad time because uh, as the PPP money expires in October, you have, uh, when you go online and you just look at uh, layoff plans for companies, it's stunning because basically, the airline industry is running at around 30% of last year's capacity. Um, when you look at hotels, uh, convention centers, car rental companies, restaurants, you know, everyone engaged in tourism in whatever form and shape, they are now coming to the realization that this virus isn't going anywhere. So we, we, we have to anticipate you know, a, a drastic reduction in employment uh, on a permanent basis in October. And so how do you deal with that? There's no a plan in, in motion that would say, uh, what, are we, what are we doing with millions of permanently unemployed people, uh, which uh, uh, will stay unemployed for a month at least. You know? So the Thrive Act is, uh, the initiative uh, is meant to assist people in thinking through their options. You know? What do you do if you have a job that is just gone? Boeing is about to lay off 30,000 people because they're closing down an entire plant. You know? So there, there is, there is um, a lot of messaging out there. Um, and the challenge really is to bring that messaging into the personal life, into the um, uh, relevant context of population groups, uh, of groups of people. The, the scale, the, scale, the magnitude of the problems at, at hand is just staggering. I mean, and the, the, the idea that we can't have those conversations is kind of crazy. So in, in, in the quick spirit of, of that, um, I, why haven't we framed this as like Pascal's wager? And so Pascal basically said, uh, might, as well, might as well believe in God because if you're wrong, you go to hell. And if you're right, you're good. Um, <laughs> Right, which has a whole bunch of cynical implications. So I'm, I, I, I take Pascal's wager lightly, but but for anybody who's a climate change denier and its effects on all the different industries and everything else that we're talking about, like why not take the bet? Because if if they're wrong about making these calls, we're really screwed. Um, and if they're right, there's a whole bunch of business, a bunch of other stuff. So that that's one thing I'm I'm, wonder, I'm wondering. Um, and then the second is, um, I made a visit to Singing Frog Farms a couple years ago with Dave Witzel and his wife, Claudia. And the thing that really hit, one of the many great things that hit me was this one regenerative farm um, had neighbors that were beginning to respect them after many years, but were all industrial farmers. 
and they had made enemies of the local John Deere representative and the person who sells fertilizer and, the, and pesticides. The, the, and those were important people in town who now hated them because they weren't buying the pesticides. They didn't need a John Deere tractor. They needed a little fork you put into the earth and then pull toward you, like a man-sized fork that helps you just loosen the soil a little bit. And, and so there was this, and, and never mind the church they went to. So there's a tremendous social resistance to doing this because all of your friends are going to hate you. <clears throat> and, and how do you tip, how do you tip that is super interesting to me. And I'll add a third story, which is Molly Melching's efforts to reverse female genital mutilation in Africa. She would go to the imams in villages and talk to them about how the Quran does not include FGM. There's no, like, hey, hey, fellas, this ritual isn't in the Quran, which is the book that includes everything, and talk them out of, in some, and I don't know the details of it, but talk them out of this really pretty brutal uh, procedure, um, which was culturally deeply, deeply ingrained. It's, it's in, insane how deeply that is ingrained. So, sorry, back to you, Klaus, but it's just a couple of- Yeah, the, the, the interesting, um thing coming out now is that we have to think in systems. So citizen climate lobby created a bill that is called the Open, uh, the uh, uh, Cohen Climate Solutions Act. And it was designed, it is designed to help farmers um, uh, compens be compensated for the loss in yield and the cost of shifting into regenerative organic uh, uh, processes. What they haven't thought through is if the farmer does these changes, that means they have to change out their crop types, they have to change out their seeds, they have to change out their crop rotations, and the entire food supply chain is not prepared to deal with that. They're, they're, they're simply unable you know, to process uh, this kind of disruption in their supply chain. Uh, they have to fundamentally reconfigure themselves. At the same time, the restaurant industry will have to adapt their menus and their entire, uh, and, and the public will have to start eating differently. So when you think about in systems context, uh, uh, then, then you have to engage the entire system and, and alert everyone to, to what is coming their way. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Pete, Matt, then me. Um, I've got three things I want to talk real quickly about. One of them just updates, not talk, I guess, not converse. Um, uh, the thing on the top of my mind, uh, Rob said earlier, uh, the barrage of information coming towards us. Uh, and I've been thinking through um, how um, I, I might kind of contribute to that barrage of information, but hopefully in a, in a better way. So I see a lot of stuff and I think I can do a decent job of curation. And, and now how can I give that uh, curated barrage to people to uh, help improve their lives? So that's one of the things I'm puzzling through right now. Um, probably most of you know about my, my uh, experiments with real-time transcription. And um, where I'm at with that is looking for kind of product models and product models and business models, I guess, that, that might make that uh, go forward. Um, so then lastly, uh, I there's yesterday kind of, I don't know, it kind of, I saw, I saw a couple of things on Twitter that made me think of something a little bit differently. So uh, one of them was uh, Andrea Chalupa and Sarah Kinzier, the Gaslit Nation, Nation people. Um, uh, I'll, I'll post the tweets in the in the chat here but she said uh, Andrea said you know so the what's going on here I, I guess we have this interesting thing where we think the system of government in the US uh, Britain is kind of the same but in the US we think they're trying to do one thing and they're doing it really badly but um, uh, what if they're actually doing a different thing than we think and they're doing it really well so uh, so Andrew Chalupa says um, uh, there's money to be made breaking up the U.S. and selling it for parts, uh, just like uh, they did in the Soviet Union. So maybe that's what's going on. Um, and the other, the other one that kind of was in that same line was uh, Jay Rosen saying uh, the White House press secretary, who we all think is trying to, you know, we think her job is is trying to communicate, you know, policy effectively. He, what he said is, no, dude, uh, she's, 
her job is to start fights with reporters to generate clips that you know speak well to uh, Trump's base. You know, so if you think of her job in that way, um, which my wife said, but that's not what we're paying her for. But if you think of her job in that way, she's doing a great job. So um, that's, that's my things. I really agree with that. And in the videos I did about Trump, I'll put a link here <clears throat> in a second. Um, I basically said um, a whole bunch of people hired Trump to shatter, to shatter the country, to shatter the system because the system wasn't working for them. And I, I kind of applied the jobs to be done framework. Which, which very much resonates with the language you just used. Um, so, and then if you look at his actions and those around his actions from that lens, through that lens, you start to see, oh, wow, like they're, they score really well, right? And, and you know, if, if the dismantling of government and the, and the retraction of, of regulations off of you know, the burden on everybody's back, if that's a goal, he's getting an A. You know, and, and if you're in his base, you're not gonna, gonna, gonna move from that because it so happens that it's really fun to do this too because you don't have to license, you don't have to limit what you get to say, you can open carry and make a, make a statement, a whole bunch of stuff sort of plays out from there. So I, I really agree with that. Um, I wish I had more time and listen to, to Gaslit Nation because they are great. Um, uh, Matt, then, Ke uh, then Kevin for um, what you wanted to add. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, um, this has been a very busy um, thinking week for me, and so there's uh, thousands of different um, dendrites kind of coming off of a lot of different things. And um, one of the galvanizing moments was actually this article that I'm going to post here from The Atlantic, which really does a, an amazing job of outlining um, kind of what happened post uh post-Civil War and the Reconstructionist movement and how immediately following this time there were um, crimes against humanity being committed in this country against Black people um, to the point where when, um, when the American population started to see what was going on, the, the sheer brutality, they, there was um, there was a lot of a lot of energy that was put around that um, Andrew Jackson, who they were equating to sort of behaving um, like Trump is behaving today um, was, you know, was replaced by um, uh, Grant. And then there was a lot of a lot of energy around this. The, the net of it, though, is everything went under everything went underground, if you will. Right. So while we outlawed these um, public and, you know, visual forms of brutality, um, we allowed them to be institutionalized. And it was actually, they talk about in there, there was a reference and it wasn't really explicit, but this, the birth of the um, small government um, aspect of the Republican party came out of, you know, the Republicans at that time were the ones that were, you know, fighting for um, and, and demanding sort of these, this equality, right? Um, but they went to small government because it was too difficult um, to deal with everything. And so they said, like, push it off to the states. And it's sort of interesting how there's been this series of um, movement um, forward or decisions that were made to avoid the really difficult truths. And um, um, it got me thinking about um, narratives and sense making and the process of sense making in a lot of cases, the way that it's done today um, for most people is that we're connecting our personal narratives to the meta narratives that we choose to believe in. Um, and uh, I'm wondering about sense making. I'm also wondering, is, is that really the core of what we're trying to do or is it sense breaking, right? Is it really about a destruction of those meta narratives that um, that have become institutionalized in um, in our lives, right? Meta narratives about um, um, really the core American meta narrative of everyone can be successful if um, if they work hard enough, and um, you know if they're smart enough, and sort of the you know this meritocracy view which is actually a false uh, you know is is in a lot of ways a false promise um and it's been a false promise 
throughout human history, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I was wondering about that. I was wondering about um, stories and their power to, um, to actually construct a mental model about the way that the world works and that those powerful stories actually are, are the things that hold us back. Um, and so rewriting stories um, and breaking down those meta narratives and, and where we're living right now in the, and, and sort of the upheaval is maybe the idea here is not for us to plan for how do we, how do we deal with the conditions of today, but how do we design ourselves for the next reconstructionist period so we don't get it wrong the way that our, um, our, our forebearers did. Um, and because I think that may be where we're gonna be is we have to allow the breakdown to happen um, and, then, and then begin to um, capture the energy that comes on the back end of that. Um, it's, it's, it's a new place for me because I'm a desperate optimist. Um, but to sort of accept that creative destruction requires things to burn um, and it's painful and it's horrible and it's sad. Um, but how do we pick up the pieces? Maybe, maybe the better question then, um, can we prevent, can we prevent um, the, the, the system from dissolving on itself? Um, and maybe that the only way that systems change is through catharsis. Um, so that's what's been on my mind. Um, yeah. I'm having a little sense of group mind here because I think that that, re that resonates really sharply with what, had, what hit me this week um, and some of the things that we've raised earlier in the conversation. Um, let's go to Kevin, then to me, <clears throat> and then uh, back to Jay for a bit. Yeah. On, on changing the name, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. We were working a couple of years ago with CNA, which is a $12 million clothing company that's not in the U.S., but in the Netherlands and everywhere. <clears throat> and they were the sponsor of our regenerative conference, but they said they couldn't use the word regenerative because that actually taken sustainability seriously. <clears throat> and they needed to show a five-year return on sustainability, which they had caused them to change the nature of their supply chain and that H&M was also there and Target <clears throat> were also there, but they were leading. And they said, we agree this is better, but you know, we've, we've changed our accounting based on trying to get to this f former thing. So the, the, they, they could not afford to go what they knew was better because they, they needed to show that, it, that the, the first thing actually worked. So changing the name, if you took the other one seriously, you know, they couldn't do it. So anyway, that was kind of interesting. Makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense, Kevin, thank you. <clears throat> um, I wanted to quickly put a couple things in the conversation as well. Uh, one is that my day yesterday was partly hijacked by this really good article by Thomas Edsall, who's an essayist in the New York Times, who always points to a lot of sociological and psychological research in his articles. <clears throat> and so he did in there. And, I, um, and that took me uh, to really interesting places. Um, let me just, and I also just put a link to uh, my videos, but let me just do a quick screen share for that spot um, because one of the questions, here's the, here's the article and here are some things that got said. These are actually people he's quoting in the article. Uh, here's the essays and, and uh, studies that he's pointing to. Uh, but I had, a, I had already started a thought called Trump and his supporters are paving the way for a coup by accusing the left of a coup, which was kind of sparked by the HHS aide, uh, Michael Caputo, <clears throat> who basically says the left is plotting a, a, a giant coup. And I'm like, holy shit. And he's, he's now had to resign. Um, but I had evidence of this before. So um, th there's a, a bunch of other things that I, that I collected up there. But then I created um, this thought, will, Ameri will there be violence across America catalyzed by the election day? And um, in the spirit of argumentation and debate, and I had a really interesting conversation yesterday with a woman, uh, Jamie Joyce, uh, who does argumentation, is working with Brad, uh, with uh, Bentley and a bunch of other people. And so I created um, a couple of thoughts opposite each other. So yes, anarchists and Antifa will deny Trump any close victory, leftists are preparing a coup, which is an argument. And then opposite it, yes, Boogaloo's and the alt-right will deny Biden any close victory. Uh, Trumpists are preparing a coup. So 
two ad nearly identical thoughts, replacing the, the, the players in, in, in the sentence. And then underneath these, I put sort of evidence. So uh, don't worry, Trump is just joking. You should never take him seriously. Um, a Biden win is gonna lead us to socialism, communism, and catastrophe. Uh, Antifa have in fact destroyed property and killed several people. So, and then opposite, I put my oppositions. I'm like, you know what? Democrats have not impeded transitions to power to Republicans. Uh, when SCOTA stopped the recounts in Florida, Gore peacefully conceded the election to Bush. Hillary conceded the election the moment, the moment Trump's electoral votes added up. Uh, Obama gracefully handed the government to Trump trying to be helpful, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, you know, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Trump has actively uh, threatened, you know, Trump has systematically sown the ground for, for a coup. He systematically supported racists and fascists and demonized their opponents. The far right is arming up. Like, like when I started populating the arguments in, in favor of this side of it, <clears throat> my eyebrows were just like rising and rising. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll send a link in to uh, this node here, which is sort of the top of the question, <clears throat> which is under another interesting thought. Uh, and Jerry, uh, yeah. um, t I mean, two, two things that just to kind of come back to, one is I, I, why shouldn't we recognize that we're trying to start a coup? I mean, is this is this not the gathering on Zoom that was happening in, you know, the the pubs and the bars at the beginning of, uh, you know, of the birth of this country, where people were saying, "Wait a second, things are not right here, and we need to change." So, I think accepting now methods and how coups happen may be part of it. The other thing that I totally forgot to say, and I need to say, which is one comment really bothered me on discourse, which was this idea of um, why, are, why are we struggling as a group to attract diversity to ourselves? Um, and um, whether it's women, whether it's um, black people, other minorities, I think that that's something we need to take very seriously. Um, um, and uh, I, I heard today that the idea of you have diversity, you have inclusion, you have equity, and then you have justice, right? Um, and we're always spending time on diversity, which is just do we have representation, you know, by the numbers? And then you go, well, inclusion is when people are represented, are their voices heard? Equity is can those, can those, can those people and individuals who are diverse can they actually get into the room? And what are the barriers to getting into the room? And I think we have systemic barriers in this group to getting in the room. And I thought that comment by Nancy about the fact that um, the pressure on women today um, to, to not only work, but to take care of the home, to do these things, which are very historical, you know, gender-based um, institutions, um, are very difficult to overcome. And I think we have to reconcile with that um, if we're gonna be open-minded open to um, open-minded sense-making versus the kind of the making sense within our own construct. So I needed to put that out there, sorry. I'm, I have a feeling that'll spark some discussion after we're done uh, checking in, I appreciate that. Um, and, um, and also I just wanted to point out the window um, this has been our situation for the last week. Uh, I think the Bay Area is clearing up, but we are expecting rain today, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. So um, we're, still, we're still in the crappiest air quality out there. Uh, it is not actually going that well for us. And then a, a small separate thought I wanted to put out, which is I'm trying to figure out how to do what I apparently have an obsession and passion for, which is like this braining and live braining sort of thing <clears throat> for a living. So I'm trying to figure out what to call myself. Uh, and we can come back to that. But I was, I was toying yesterday with getting something like visualthinker.com, which is available uh, and heading in, in that territory. So that actually seems in the context of the things we're talking about, like a less important thing. And I know Tony just joined us. Uh, Tony, if you wanna check in. Uh, well, nothing going on with me today. I have nothing to say. Thank you much for asking. All right, thanks. Nice to see you here. Um, and Matt, I think your question is really important. So I want to, I want to head back there too. Uh, Jay, uh, 
there you are. You want to jump back in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, a couple of things that I think that just keep drawing me back in this group. Um, first of all, I want to just come back to a moment that, that I had uh, on a call with Matt, actually, that, that really kind of struck a new era uh, for me was Matt was, uh, if it's okay that I share this, Matt was uh, in, the, in the children's hospital um, on a call that we were having. His daughter was having some health stuff, and I believe that she's doing okay. Um, I'm just bringing this up because I, we were talking to Matt and he was in the children's hospital with a mask on, um, on a, our call. And this is just like the, you know, I, I think this is kind of, there's kind of a new normal in terms of, you know, now we're just, we just drove 2000 miles away and now we're on the call and, and we have to deal with everything, deal with, you know, villages burning, deal with coups, um, deal with health, issues economic issues and um get on our calls and be entrepreneurs and be social change artists and you know this is everything at once so there's an art of um kind of i think vibrant compartmentalization um where it's it's both a presence i'm trying to come up with a term for this i'm like life in parallel everything at once whatever you call it it's kind of grief and vision at the same time but we have to have space for that grief, for that transformation, I realized personally that I just shoved it away because I couldn't deal with it. Um, and now we're like sleeping on the deck here at my in-laws house in our, in our tent and, you know, on our calls because I still have to launch things. So I want to just identify that little nugget and Matt, forgive me if that was, I hope that was okay. But the, um, the key to this is it is everything at once. So we have to operate in that way in a healthy way. And number two, it's kind of like the innermost cave and insight at the same time. So we're like in the cave, but also needing to be at that kind of moment of insight or also sometimes in that moment of insight in the same day in parallel. So it's like all of these worlds that we're working with. I want to do a, a little anecdote and then get to my kind of other main point, which is um, J.R. Ewing. We know who J.R. Ewing was, I think, in this age group and demographic, right? Um, uh, so uh, Larry Hagman was walking down the street in... Uh, I believe it was Sofia, Romania um, in the late 90s. And people kept on coming up to him and saying, J.R. Ewing, thank you so much for saving Romania. And again and again, they would do this. And he was like very, very curious about what they were talking about. Well, it turns out that Krzyzewski, um left, um, he cut out all external media, but he left the um, state programming and Dallas. And the reason he left Dallas was because uh, you can imagine because he wanted to show how terrible the West was. And so um, what happened was actually the opposite. He wanted to show how terrible the West was, but people were looked at their lives and they looked at their lives standing in line for, you know, hours and hours for food and waiting in line for, um, you know, 10 years uh, online for 10 years to get a car and living these cement, the cement structures. And they looked at Dallas and they saw the, you know, um, the, the sexy women and the big cars and the money to burn. And they said, you know, why am I living this life? You know, why am I not living that life? And basically, as the story goes, it led to revolution. It led to Krzyzewski's demise. And so that story has already, has always struck, struck me. Of course, Dallas was the biggest show ever in, you know, in, in human civilization. Um, but it struck me because it's a version of showing a different reality that can truly be transformative. And I've thought a lot about this, like what's the modern version of Dallas? And it's not showing the crappy reality of the evil, you know, like the, 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 the skeptics and the jealousy and all that. Although to have a good story, you have to have all those components. So my question is, and this is where I come back to this group because I'm in kind of parallel conversations in the um, Rogue Valley about how do we build dome villages for people that have been outplaced and how do we create something that looks, that, that actually steps us towards the future because we've been driving across the country and seeing all these businesses closed and it's just totally heartbreaking and I get why people are suffering and I get why people are afraid and I get why they're wanting somebody to solve it for them, even if the, that's made of, as you said before, bullshit, um, because they want hope. And so my, the, the, the opportunity, I'll just kind of state this as an opportunity for the group, is to leverage a kind of interdimensional um, story, um, story that shows up in all of these different places and ways 
um, but that's backed with true foundational systems that I think this group is, is uniquely poised to do. So it's like, it is a story, it is a living story. It might be one part, very live, real narrative um, that shows a world in parallel that works. It might be at the same time a design project that's creating those components in a collaborative way of what it might look like and building um, test systems to do so. It's, so it's kind of like a reality experiment. So that's, that's my statement for today. That was great. Um, exactly, and I'd love to know what other people think about what you just said. Please jump in. I mean, I think this is where a new Manhattan project can actually be quite interesting, right? And, you know, there's a lot of conversation and dialogue, but maybe the reality is, is we, we just have to start, we have to find we have to find land and territory and, and start designing and building and living the right way. And maybe by living the right way, Max, you, I mean, sorry, um, Jay, um, we, um, Max's name is right underneath your picture. So, um, but maybe this is the way that we actually can model what it is and create new, create new pattern language and new operating systems that just that just work better and invite people to join them. I, you know, I don't know. Is it, is that the path? There's a, there's a long historic movement toward utopian communities. Um, it, it goes way, way back, you know, forever. Uh, in the U S there's lots of amusing stories of utopian communities. There's many efforts to do this. Um, I, I love the idea. And I just posted about uh, Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, which, which for me was a piece of that, which you know, where the theme is the world, it's a dystopian future, the world is broken. There are normals who live in cities and then there are people who've walked away into formerly uninhabitable places. But because we have magical 3D printers and because there's this ubiquitous cloud where all of our design plans are stored, you can kind of create life anywhere you want to. And then what happens between the normals and the walkaways? Uh, but the walkaways have a whole bunch of like like utopian things about how they live, how they make decisions, what, what goes on there. And then every time they have to walk away from one of their settlements, they fix what, was, what wasn't working from the last one. So there's kind of this notion that they improve the structure and design of the thing they do when they're forced to walk away. So loss becomes a little bit of gain in some sense and they have to be resilient because the, in, the interactions are very nasty. Um, um, other other comments on Jay's comment? Uh, sorry, Doug, I saw your hand up, go ahead. Well, uh, going out into the land and redesigning how things are done is unfortunately in land that's already owned by somebody else and they're gonna resist that like mad. And we're in a position where all the things that are good imply somebody loses. And we're gonna to have to cope with that. I don't know how to do it, but it's like, we're gonna to have to go through a speed bump with a lot of cost to it to get to the place where we can do things that are really beneficial. Um, totally agree. I posted earlier um, a link to globalwarmingrealestate.com, which I'm just remembering I posted on the chat. I don't know if anybody saw that or heard me talk about it before, <clears throat> but in a fit of peak after a conversation like this a decade ago, <laughs> maybe longer. I bought the domain and put up a website, which I've now reconstituted. And the idea was, if you don't believe in the science of, of climate change, maybe you see a business opportunity. Uh, and so, you know, tongue in cheek, it's like real estate that's up, you know, up, uphill from, from seashores. Uh, I, I invented uh, H2O motors because forget jet skis and sea dews, we're going to need the SUVs of the, of the modern urban, you know, sea, sea washed uh, city, etc. And then I put another link here, which does not exist on the web, but I bought the domain raftify.com, I think after the same conference, because I was starting to realize we might have to raft ourselves together on the seas, three quarters of the earth's surface is, is ocean. Um, how might we learn to live comfortably on the oceans and uh, don't go to the sea setting institute for news on this that's actually sort of a trying to create a libertarian utopian on on cruise ships uh, but i interviewed a guy who was doing open ocean sailing as an open source project kind of like uh, the project that, that was posted earlier in our chat about uh, creating you know the machines for civilization uh, uh, that maceg uh check no I'm forgetting the name of the guy who's, who's doing that one um, but, but, you know, how, if, if 
if territory on land is hard to find, maybe we make territory, you know, on, on the oceans or something. I don't know. I think that the, there, are, there are small groups trying many of these things. Do you, do you know, Jerry, that Walkaway's um, tagline, or at least this version of it, is it's time to take the country back from radical leftists? In the book, you mean? No, in, on the, the website, walkawaycampaign.com. So I don't know if it's been you know, co-opted. Co uh, I don't know where it sits. Um, it's definitely these, you know, uh, it rallies against um, the radical left. Yeah. Uh, we can no longer t uh, t tolerate the destruction of property and lives, the vilification of law enforcement, the weaponization of tragedies. Our wow. silent is, it's, it's like almost like a, it looks like a QAnon website. I mean, a QAnon, um, very interesting, very interesting. Um, and the language is also the, this is the other part about the language. It's also the language about a, an America for all Americans and, you know, but it's, I'm, I'm baffled by just the bullshit. <laughs> Um, <laughs> going back to that comment. So two thoughts here, and one about the thing you said earlier on coups, which is, you know, isn't the left trying to plot a coup? And I, I think coup, me, coup to me, usually, usually, I mean, there's bloodless coups, right? But coups usually mean like weapons and you take over the airport and all that. Um, and I, I, I don't know that the left is trying to do that at all. I, I, and the left may be completely naive about this because if the right is planning one and the left is unarmed, this is not going to end really well. Um, and then separately, I, I had a discussion on Facebook that was really, really interesting for me and I hope for others. Um, I asked the question, is there a better word for when you accuse your opponents of doing what you are doing? Uh, and we, the closest we sort of came was gaslighting and DARVO. And I don't know if anybody's heard of DARVO, but deny the abuse, then attack the victim for attempting to make them accountable for their offenses, thereby reversing victim and offender, basically. But, but this is usually in an abusive family situation or abusive partner situation. Um, so it doesn't really have a context as political strategy, which is, I think, what's going on. Um, I'll put a link to this node uh, in our chat uh, right now. You know, uh, I keep thinking how we could deal with this at the cultural and religious level. How, do we, how could we have Christianity without the baggage and overhead? Why can't we just have a movement to treat each other well? Uh, you know, take the person that you know who's in the, best, in the worst trouble and do something about it. Uh, that kind of culture feels to me like it, it just cries out to, to be what we do. Uh, but there's no move in that direction yet. I, I saw a quote posted just yesterday. I've forgotten who the quote, who the speaker was, but um, things are never so bad that you can't do a kindness for somebody. Yeah, I saw that too. Wonderful line. Might have been Wendell Berry or somebody like Wendell that. Wendell Berry. Yeah, it was. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, I agree. And, and, I had a, in one of, one of my wanderings a couple of years ago, I was thinking about like uh, rules for living life and uh, the 10 commandments. I have a whole riff on the 10 commandments, how they're really pretty, the, the Bible and the 10 commandments are not good rules for like working a life. Um, and the one that I landed on that I really love is from Thich Nhat Hanh, which is deep listening and loving speech. And I prefer that to the golden rule because doing good, doing what's good for other people is really easily misinterpreted apparently or because the golden rule exists in, in every major religious uh, tradition. Um, but I really liked deep listening and loving speech. And uh, if we could slow down enough to do that, we might get somewhere, but things are accelerating. Other thoughts on this? Because I, I think we're, we're having, unfortunately, a realistic conversation about the current situation. Klaus, go ahead. It looks like you were leaning in to talk. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I find the the, there is so much confusion um, about what people are railing against. Right? So most of it is focused on the political process when in all reality, the change is driven by corporate interests. Uh, and I see that in the food business so much. You know, the, the, uh, 
you, you, you have global uh, companies that have established a supply chain that has its own logic. And what is happening with climate change and with environmental destructions and so on, it turns out that system is toxic you know, to, to our world and it has to change, it has to reform itself. But they can't figure out how to adapt their business models in, in, in stay and survive this decentralization that is required. So the, um, the attempts to change, you know, uh, the, the, the entire conflict is focused on the political system where the political system really is just a pawn uh, uh, because it is completely controlled. So, so we can achieve more if we want to have a revolution, my, my thing growing a revolution really hinges on our personal individual behavior uh, multiplied by millions. So if we change our, uh, if we adapt, for example, our diets, you know, our shopping behavior and our consumption behavior, we can create massive changes that we can force change as consumers. And the, the entire system is aligned to avoid that from happening, right? So, I mean, for example, when I worked with Disney still, um, we, we, you know, we, we had ABC and there was a chef, a British chef who highlighted, who created the, uh, the, the term, um, uh, what was it called again? He, 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 he uh, explained how hamburger meat had, uh, what was it, slime? I mean, he called it uh, pink slime or something like this. It cost, uh, it cost the closing of three factories and Disney got sued for $100 million. So, so the idea of commercial speech is embedded in our legal system and it actually prohibits free speech. You now commercial speech supersedes the First Amendment and most people don't realize that. So you can't advertise, for example, uh, and say, say things that are harmful to a company or to a brand and so on without getting sued. So, so the, to have a communication process you know, that, that engages large numbers of motivated people and give them direction on how they can impact the system uh, it, it is, is, a, is, a, is a real challenge. You know? The current, one of the things that struck me when Trump won was that not only did Trump win the, win the presidency, but he had a majority of both houses uh, and he had, and uh, three quarters of the state legislators were Republican, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like this was a, a thorough, a thorough beating right through all, you know, all levels of US government that had taken 30 years to get to. It was, I think this was a, a very slow methodical plan. I'm happy to talk more about that, my beliefs on that. Um, and we haven't had, and the left doesn't have a similar sort of thing and, and didn't, and maybe trying a little bit now, but we haven't tried the similar sort of thing with corporations. Like, I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know of a movement for young people to go in and take jobs at corporations and work their way into leadership who think better about these things. I know of some companies that are doing better things, but I don't know of a sort of an operation to just change uh, change the brains of the major corporations right. by, by entering them. Anybody, Judy, is, uh, I think you just unmuted yourself. Did you want to jump in? Well, I don't know. I'm still just thinking about not so much trying to start at the macro level of change, but how to catalyze individuals who frame certain topics and frame a circle of people and digest that topic and then each person in the circle goes to dread it. And I think that's more reasonable for us to undertake than taking on big business, government, military, <laughs> whatever the large institutions are that need to change. And I'm not saying they don't need to be addressed, but unless you get some action going in lots of different places to pull less vision, I don't see how you can make changes in big systems. What is it? Let's come up. The password will help. Um, Doug, I think you're, one of your lines is, is not muted. Oh, he just left the room. Okay, so we won't hear any more from him. And I can actually mute him from here. Perfect. Um, other thoughts on this? Because I, I, my own instinct on this is we need to work all levels at once. And that, and that somehow 
even though the left has been obsessed with, with convincing people that there's better ways of creating large scale organization, government, what have you, it has done a poor job of the social process of doing that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I very much agree. <clears throat> My favorite change tool in the world is when a, f a person you trust takes you by the hand to try something new. That, that, that's my favorite change process because most of us won't try something new all by ourselves. It's like a little scary or we're, not, we're too busy or whatever. But if someone we, we really sort of like and trust says, hey, I, you know, try, try this thing with me or come to this meeting with me or something like that, and then we can begin to experience it, that, that's a really huge change agent. And it's a very simple, simple change agent. Um, so what does that look like? Go ahead, Charles. Um, just to comment quickly, maybe a little bit obvious, but, but um, you know, the idea of changing the system or just going on the other end of the spectrum, Judy mentioned about going dendritic and kind of just, I'm just, I'm just thinking sort of local, hyper-local and also global versus or before maybe as a, as a pre precursor to going global. Um, I, I don't know if it needs more detail, but uh, yeah, context, it's all about context and in terms of trying to get the wisdom or, or the, the broader good of the whole, what's the whole at any given time, so. And the whole doesn't really have a view of itself. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I, I, I think we're lacking direction. There, there, is, there is no destination that is universally agreed. Once we have a destination, then the efforts can splinter in, in millions of ways and everyone can uh, uh, have their own contribution within their own context. But when I look at the rage and the anger in Portland, for example, you know, people in the street, well, that's completely misdirected anger. It doesn't achieve change. You know, it only creates more conflict. It, 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 I mean, if, you know, uh, conflict uh, uh, creates friction, which wastes energy. So, so if we had an idea you know, that, uh, or, or a clear understanding of where we need to go to and how we can help one another and how we can truly mm -hmm. impact the system, then the efforts can atomize, but we don't have that vision. Um, other thoughts? Do we, are we lacking the vision? Is like, where are we on this? What do you feel? <laughs> I think Jay's thing of like wandering around and touching on things and it was it was kind of like a duck duck goose but it made sense of the whole all the ducks that made sense and if you want to make a coherent plan it falls into this dead space and everybody doesn't know what to say I think we need to approach it like wandering around and touching on things anyway Jay go ahead Jay, did you want to jump in? Oh, okay. You unmuted yourself, so I thought you were heading in. Uh, Doug. Well, I, th I think the change that we need needs to be in terms of the way we do food, but also where we live, and also the culture that we do it in. And I don't see how you get there except by recovering from a disaster. Uh, the problem of trying to get to a better place without going through a disaster is that people sense that they have to lose the current life that they have, which in many cases is what they feel is worth holding on to. And, and by some strange twist of fate, we are currently uh, in, <clears throat> in a gigantic dislocation. I mean, uh, just, the, just the pandemic, never mind the economic things, but when you start layering on the various things that are happening, a lot of industries are being, uh, Klaus was talking about it earlier on this call, that, that there's lots of industries that just are not going to come back. Many people will be laid off, um, et cetera. So we have a moment where if we could model, paint, or, or live in better on-ramps to new ways of being, doing, living in place, and so forth, that might actually work. I mean, that. Part, partly, I'm interested in, you know, what do kids do once they get tired of trying to pretend like they're going through normal school in Zoom, right? How do you, how do you that opens a huge opportunity to, to, to think differently and, and learn differently. <clears throat> uh, Kevin, go ahead and then Mark, I think. 
I, I was just, you know, what Doug, what Jay did was really good. Uh, I've seen Doug do it one time. Like somebody gets designated each each OGM call to be the thread connector, you know, the duck duck goose person whose job is not to say something new, but to connect three or four things every half hour. And and that's only their job. And so, so somebody's like the external sense maker to, to the thing. It could be a, a traded off role. Um, or but several. You can't say your new ideas. You have to, you have to, you have to connect to it. The, the, the limit might be as design thing. You have to connect at least three things people have said. Um, and I think some of us are sort of, I mean, I know that Pete's doing a fabulous job of mavenizing during our calls um, at warp speed um, and contributing to the conversation. So, so can, we, can we apply our own medicine to our, to our process here? Uh, Lauren, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just kind of uh, it, connecting the uh, few dots that we've had of, um, oh, shoot. Between what we've been ideating on and Judy, um, you know, to OGM, like in a practical sense, what can we actually do? And we love talking about big things, but it's what, can, what big changes can we actually affect? And uh, again, back to what I was saying, maybe, uh, you know, our specialty can be coining these terms. And if we can do that, we can, that's kind of like what we like to do, what we do anyway. But if we could do that with more focus and then we can coin these new terms, then we can actually measure our impact. If they're new terms, we can actually measure them on the internet. How many times are they appearing in Twitter and see where they're appearing and then measure that like marketing and there, there are already established ways to do that and see where in our network are things, you know, being affected, like uh, who, what combinations of people are causing magic to happen, but we can actually see that and measure it and make smaller campaigns like Peter was saying in another call, <clears throat> but see where are we are having success. Yeah. And I each of us is involved in communities and projects that we care about and we're each listening to each other and trying to be helpful to each other. So in some sense, in some sense, there's a lot of meme transmission or idea transmission between us and we're trying to sort of uh, shake things into better alignment, but we're, but we're not using our tools that well because the tools barely exist. Um, I was realizing yesterday in the middle of, of <clears throat> the kind of arguments I was trying to build that I could really benefit from connecting over to Mark's uh, climate web stuff and, and just sort of borrow in and, and, and click and connect, but I don't do that. Um, and we could sort of, we could sort of share brains on pieces of that, build a better argument. Um, so, so how might we step through those, uh, those barriers as well? Go ahead, Mark. And, and I do link into your brain, Jerry, just to let people know. Um, but, but coming back to Doug's point for just a second, it, it's actually interesting because you, you would think that after these kinds of natural disasters that we're having um, on, from a climate change perspective, it might be a good time to get people thinking differently about climate change. Unfortunately, the studies that have been done on that come to exactly the opposite conclusion, just because when people are in that state, they are so desperately thinking about returning to normal that adding the idea that you can't return to normal and you shouldn't be thinking about returning to normal is it just creates even more cognitive dissonance for them and, and they just can't deal with it. So it's, it's a bit of a catch 22. Um, which is, um, hold on, if only I could type, um, which brings me just to vocabulary because I, I realized a couple of years ago that I didn't really like sustainability and resilience because they implied to me uh, being like a rubber band, being snapping back to the same place they were you were before, uh, where plasticity implies reshaping and the ability. Some thermoplastics let you reshape them into some new setting, and to me, thriving and flourishing um, were words that allowed me to start thinking about completely changing how things are being done, where you are, how you live, whatever you do, uh, and then reorienting them in a different way. So, so I've, I've changed sort of how I talk about these things in that in that way um, because we, we when 
when trauma hits, our creativity shuts down, our short-term memory shuts down, like a whole bunch of things really short, uh, short circuit. And it's very hard to, um, it's very hard to think of new things or imagine like some great new way. You just kind of want want what you had. So how do we build out from that? Uh, Charles, go ahead. Just a quick comment, um, re recalling a metaphor that I've been, some of us um, have gone into on and off over the last months is in terms of resilience, my sense of that, why it's still useful and it may be good in the sense of, of resilience in a journey, in, a, in the process of moving forward, transitioning um, and becoming sort of robust and having integrity. The, the metaphor of the, the ship at sea and especially um, um, not just sort of the, the tides and the waves, but the storms, you know, this kind of thing. Just offering that. Agreed. We're coming up on, on 90 minutes and uh... So I think we should probably wrap on, on the half. Uh, anyone with concluding thoughts? This, I'm, I'm really torn about this call because it feels like we are in the middle of an, er, of, of an emergency and we're talking in that way, but it also we're, we're all frustrated in that we're talking that way. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Jay, then Hank. Um, it's possible. It's not a future we want to think about, but it's possible that this is, is actually, there's a fair likelihood that this unraveling just continues that um, that fear and disconnection is an epic strategy to bring us into this next um, level of politics. And, um, you know, so it's possible that this is kind of the warm up conversation for two months from now where we're like, oh, shit, I can't believe that happened um, politically. And so I think there's a kind of new normal in terms of mayhem, in terms of upheaval, in terms of shifting, in terms of the necessity to compartmentalize, uh, but yet deal with all of the components. And so, and I, I think this is, I know this has been said in different forms, but just restating this piece that I was describing, what, I, what I'm kind of trying to poke at here is that if we can bring together all of the forces that we're working with, all of the component parts that we're acting on, all of the skills that we have, um, rather than just breaking them out into different iterations and different possibilities, and story can be a, a piece of it, a, a guiding piece, a meta piece, um, but also a micro piece because it involves human transformation on the root level. Um, and the various technologies, messaging, all the components can help us to actually create something that gives possibility. To me, that's a win. I know those are big words, um, but I think that in an hour and a half of talking just about that, we could probably gain some, some ground. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, Hank, did you want to jump in? No, I raised my hand kind of on accident, so or oh, physically. Okay. So I'll, was, I will cede the time to somebody else. It was my auctioneer reflex that that saw you. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but I, but I Thanks for the people. opportunity. Um, anyone else with uh, closing words for this call? Closing thoughts. Um, I just wanted to reflect. Um, I've been turning in the background um, and uh, actually I've had a lot of trouble with the transcriber crashes regularly. So I have to restart it and I'm you know juggling bunches of tabs and stuff like that. But um, I wanted to reflect that it it feels good. Um, I can think back, you know, three months, six months, 12 months, two years, something like that, where everything seemed horrible and like it was unfixable and it was just doom and gloom and, you know, we couldn't do anything. Um, we still have a lot of that, I think, but we also have, I, I see this group, these people here working through issues quickly and, and reasonably efficiently and, and with a lot of group mind process. Um, we're bouncing ideas off of each other, picking up thoughts from e each other, working working the problem, I think. Um, so it's it feels good to not only be kind of past one of, you know, several stages of, of grief um, uh, in the 
apocalypse that we're we're in particip multiple apocalypses that we're participating in, but that also it feels like we're starting to be able to stand up and start to walk uh, in that environment and be able to to actually think and you know decide what we might want to do to actually talk about possibilities and, and change and things like that. Um, I also wanted to kind of um, thank everybody and apologize a little bit. Um, I was trying to grab, not only was I grabbing links and stuff, I was also grabbing some transcript stuff and dropping it in. This was a great little experiment in trying to do it and, and um, Zoom was mostly fighting me. Um, so, um, so I can imagine, I, or I have a dream. I have a dream where we have some power tools in the background that work a lot better than the ones that we do now. And that a team like this, uh, I don't know the, the context, but a team like this could be like uh, airdropped into, into a larger conversation. Um, and we could do real time sense making and real time like projection into multiple alternatives and paths and ways to figure that out. So, um, so thanks, thank you everybody for um, for that. I really like your dream, Pete. And I think that, and I would love to know whether organizations would love to have that and would pay for it, because I think that's a, a tremendous um, service that improves thinking. And uh, it's a, you're describing a really nice goal of, of opening a global mind, uh, how, you know, how to, how to improve the process of thinking together, making decisions together. So I'd, lo I'd love to see that happen. Um, maybe we need like a paratroop core. Um, and thank you for what you what you were doing uh, intensely on the call like the speed with which you did a couple of those things was like um, Amazing <clears throat> Charles would you uh, would you be so kind as to read the, the poem and then we'll go out of the call Sure, Glad to um, I thought I would just I I, I found this cool image from uh, David Preston <laughs> I, I would reveal the, the fork in the road there um, <laughs> Anyway um, ah. Okay. You know the, to the kids' light. book, The Clown Around? Sorry? You know the kids' book, The Clown Around. They take a vacation and find a fork in the road. Anyway. I don't know. It. That's, no. cool. Never mind. Uh, I'll have to find it. it book. It's a great kids' book. Yeah. Okay. The clowns take a vacation. To the light of September, when you are already here, you appear to be only a name that tells of you, whether you are present or not. And for now, it seems as though you are still summer, still the high familiar endless summer, yet with a glint of bronze in the chill mornings and the late yellow petals of the mullein fluttering on the stalks that lean over their broken shadows across the cracked ground. But they all know that you have come, the seed heads of the sage, the whispering birds with nowhere to hide you, to keep you for later. You who fly with them, you who are neither before nor after, you who arrive with blue plums that have fallen through the night, perfect in the dew. Thank you, Charles. That's and, beautiful. And thanks everybody else. Um, we will close out this call and uh, see you online and uh, let's figure some of this stuff out. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry.